This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Welcome back. We're going to talk about composition today. I do a lot of composition videos. I think it's something that is not taught often enough in photography. It's something I'm very passionate about. And when I talk about composition in those videos, I tend to use the term visual communication a lot. And I get asked a lot, consequently, what do I mean by that? To me, visual communication is really the essence of photography. It determines whether a photograph is successful or not. Is there any kind of relationship between the image that's made and the viewer? Is there something they get out of seeing that? What is communicated to them? Is it an emotion? Is it a statement of some kind? Is it just something that's pleasing to look at? I mean, there's no right or wrong answer here, but inevitably there always is something that's communicated. Whether or not it's successful really separates average photos from photos that are really pretty incredible. Let's back up for one second. What is communication? So right now I am communicating to you through a video and at the moment I'm using language to do that. What is language? Well, language is a set of words that come together and they group into an idea. I think you could boil it down even on a more macro level and you can say that a word is a series of abstract sounds that come together that are individual, at least in terms of context, but when put into context, you start recognizing the sounds that I'm making as words and sentences and paragraphs and I start to communicate an idea. So remember, abstraction within context. So years ago, I actually studied music in college. That's what my formal training is in and I bring a lot of that into the visual realm in terms of my approach to photography. And so when I remember when I got serious about photography, I actually went back to school and I thought that there would be some kind of theoretical framework, much like there is with music where you've got harmony and you've got rules and subsets that things can either hang on or they can start to drift away from, but you have a framework that everything attaches to. Photography is a little bit different than that because you don't have necessarily that framework. The framework is the human experience. So for instance, what we can can recognize like you might be able to see a shape like a triangle a square a circle well what do those mean really on their own they're abstract and so again we have to put that into context let me I think the music thing might work to explain this but, but hold on hold on one second okay I almost never do this on the show but I'm going to use the guitar as an example here so music is the organization of sound you've got notes you can have multiple notes that play together you can have rhythm so on and so forth so if we take it down to the most basic building block if I play you one note okay that probably doesn't mean very much if you have perfect pitch you might say oh well that's middle C but so what one note out of context is completely abstract but what if I took two notes and played them at the same time so let's take the next note up which from C would be D and if I play those together okay those notes are really close together so they have what we call tension there's an enormous amount of tension actually one of those notes needs to go somewhere for that to achieve resolution so I could take either the bottom note and take it down to a B so if I went and then Okay, we have tension and resolution. You go the other way too. Take the, C, the D up to an E. So anyway, that's my point is now we have something that starts moving. It starts saying something. It becomes less abstract. We're building tension. We're moving things and we're creating resolution. So on and so forth. Anyway. I don't play a lot of guitar these days, so I'm really rusty. So that ends our little demonstration there. But you get my point is that one note doesn't make a lot of sense on its own, but in context to something else, then we start talking and saying something. So you might be asking me, Ted, how does this relate to photography then? Because music has a structure, has a framework that works with it. Well, one last music quote here. One of my best friends in the world, Thad Meyer, we went to college together. He was in town a few months ago. His son's like this brilliant organist. And we were having this nerdy discussion about music when we were hanging out one afternoon. And he said, you know, what's fascinating about music that a lot of people just don't grasp right at the beginning is that essentially music is made up of patterns that could be rhythm them that could be uh, melodic patterns that could be harmonic patterns and as soon as you start to understand those patterns patterns indicate predictability so you can start to predict where those are going to go and they might be hanging within a framework somehow they might be breaking outside that framework but again it's all pattern based and I'm going to argue that the same is probably true for visual arts behind me on this wall there is a series of nine photographs I realize that they are out of focus to you slightly right now there is a method to my madness these are a series of botanical images that were taken by Carl Blossfeld very famous photographer I did a video on him years ago one of my favorites he was not a photographer 
photographer by vocation. He was actually a botany teacher. He used photography to show his students slides of various forms in nature. And actually, that was the context of his first book, one of the most famous books ever, especially early on. Anyway, Forms in Nature deals with exactly that. Now, we all know what a plant is, and a plant in and of itself probably isn't very exciting to most people, but when you put these in a more artistic sensibility, and I know they're out of focus, but if you see these in focus, you can see that Carl is dealing with shape, he's dealing with line, he's dealing with symmetry, he's dealing with relationships between objects, between shapes. These are the ultimate study in abstractions that all of a sudden, much like music, when you put them in context, they start to make sense. It's kind of why they're on the wall to remind me. They're one, some of my favorite photographs. And I, of course, you could probably argue that the order I put them in probably has a lot to do with it too because they have relationships with one another. But that's the fascinating thing about all this. I'm going to give you another example. And I want to talk you through this. One of my favorite photographers ever, obviously. Talk about him a lot. Henri Cartier-Bresson. One of my favorite photographs ever. I want to break this down and we're going to look at some relationships and talk about visual communication in this context, which is surrealism essentially. But real quick, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at squarespace.com. I am actually redesigning my personal website right now, and I'm going to be using Squarespace. So I've been sharing a lot of images with you guys in these videos. This is something that I want to share more of, be able to put links and things to when I have collections made. Squarespace is an awesome place to do that. It really is the easiest way to build a website. You can build an online portfolio. You can even build an e-commerce store on here. The tools have really gotten good. How easy is Squarespace to use? Well, you're gonna start with one of their award-winning templates. Now, all of these templates are customizable. Your content is separate from the template, so you can change the entire look. If you feel like you need a complete refresh or you're not sure on something, you can get things to look exactly like you want them. What good is a website if nobody's looking at it? Will Squarespace have the right social tools and email integrations in here so you can do your own website promotion as well? My favorite part of Squarespace, well, it's really intuitive. So if you can drag and drop a folder of images, you can build a photo gallery. It's that easy. You can easily go into the settings to customize everything to your life hook it up to your own domain. In fact, they sell those too, and you are in business. So head over to Squarespace using the link below this video, and you can try it out for absolutely free. And when you do decide that Squarespace is right for you, I can save you an additional 10% on your first order by using offer code AOP. So once again, offer code AOP, and I want to give a special shout out and thanks to the awesome folks at Squarespace for sponsoring this video. All right, so decisive moment, page 26, one of my favorite images ever made. This is Henri Cartier-Bresson. This was shot in 1932. It is titled Behind the Guerre Saint-Lazare. Saint-Lazare is a train station in Paris. You can see it in the background. The image deals with this guy jumping over a puddle. You've probably seen this. What's interesting about this image, I have a print of this in my office that hangs behind my desk. You guys have probably seen it when I do tutorials. What's interesting about that image is people who come over to my studio who don't know anything about photography always recognize that image. It's kind of curious to me. They don't necessarily know who photographed it. They're like, wait, I've seen that before. That's a famous picture, right? Yeah, it's a very famous picture and it's pretty awesome. And we're going to break it down and talk about it. A few interesting things to note about this photograph is that, first of all, this is a pretty early Henri Cartier-Bresson. He was 24 when he did this image, which probably suggests some of his greater ability as a photographer than us mere mortals, but uh, it's an early image. Second thing that's interesting about it is this is a rare occurrence where Henri Cartier-Bresson cropped an image. He didn't do a lot of cropping in post-production. He usually got things right in the camera. In fact, he almost never did it. This image was an exception, and as he puts it when he talks about this image, is that this was shot through a fence and the fence structure was such that you couldn't get the lens all the way forward in it so part of the fence unfortunately is in the photograph and so this is actually cropped how do we know this well i found a picture of the original negative this is an interesting photo that was done a couple years ago for a book that john leogran did called celebrating the negative the entire book is portraits of famous negatives and usually the photographer who took them is hands now there are some exceptions the hands in this photograph are not Henri cartier bresson's there's those of his printer but thus, this is the negative, and you can see where the cropping occurred and the original negative that had a fence in it. There are also several variations depending on where you see this image hanging. There were different prints made. Some of them are different dimensions, and I think it's neither really here nor there because sometimes you get a slightly taller image and there's more sky or more foreground at the bottom, but the composition remains intact. So why is this a successful image? That's what I want to get to in my little breakdown.
top-down critique here. So the first thing that your eye is clearly drawn to is the guy jumping over the puddle. It's the action that happens in the photograph. It's what Bresson referred to as the decisive moment. Would this be the same picture with no background and just the guy jumping over the puddle? I think it would still be an interesting image, but I don't think it would have the depth and just the staying power that this image has. And that's why I think the rest of the image is really important. Now, remember, I talked the whole spiel about music, abstraction, words, communication. We have abstracts that don't make sense until you put them in context. Then you have relationships between the subjects or the relationships of figures on our ground, so to speak. So what we can see here is that we have the guy jumping over the puddle. Well, there's another guy in the background that's looking through the fence. And so based on your own experience, my interpretation of that, which is just my interpretation based on my own past experiences, what we're seeing there is a reflection of you seeing through the scene. In other words, Bresson is looking through a fence shooting this. Now, that's not going to be anything that you see a curator talk about. That's just my own personal take on it. But there is more. So first of all, if you look in the back, there is a advert back here for the Relowski Circus. And in the 99s that you see over in the corner, the two nines, if you look at the counter, they're done with a photograph of a figure with a gestural pose that mirrors the guy jumping over the puddle. And if we look also, we have reflection coming from the water. So everything is duplicated below. So we have those figures that all relate to each other because they're all similar in nature and they all work together. They are placed in a very specific manner. There's also some stuff that balances out the composition. I think you could argue in the foreground, you've got the ladder that he's using to jump. We also have the broken hoops and there's some stuff in the foreground. And so this really just balances this out. This is of a entitled behind the railway station. And really the railway station has little to do with this other than being the background. The other really interesting thing about this image is that I think this is a really amazing example of surrealism in photography. Now, Henri Cartier-Bresson talked a lot about the influence that surrealism had on his own work. In fact, he always described his own work as being surrealism taken into the context of photojournalism. And so sometimes it's not nearly as bizarre, psychedelic, or blatant as what we think of when we think of surrealists. But it's interesting. And if you look back at probably the most famous surrealist that everybody would know would be Salvador Dali. And when you look at the Dali paintings, well, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at very identifiable objects. So for instance, the melting clocks, everybody can identify what, what the clock is, but they're in context of this kind of otherworldly landscape, which I always find interesting. And you see this a lot in surrealistic paintings. In fact, let's get away from Dali for a minute because I don't think the melting clocks is going to have as much of a relationship with what we're seeing in Bresson's work. But there's another painter by the names of Yves Tanguy, who was a French surrealist who was pretty brilliant. In fact, if you go into any major art museum that has any surrealism in their collection, you'll usually see these Tanguy paintings. Tanguy was brilliant in doing these bizarre, otherworldly kind of lunar landscapes and these abstract figures on the top and how do they relate to that landscape and the landscape is always an important part of these paintings I think it was with Dali as well and I know I'm nitpicking on the landscape but that's exactly what we see in the Henri Cartier-Bresson photograph this is not a landscape in the sense that we can recognize uh, grass or trees or dirt or mounds or even mountains sand things that we typically associate with a photography landscape something like Ansel Adams this is something that becomes surreal because it's otherworldly it's large largely reflective. In fact, the entire landscape ground is reflective in this image. Now, when I was younger and I first got into Henri Cartier-Bresson, I was convinced that this shot was set up. There was no way that any photographer could get that lucky to get this, this shadow of a figure jumping over a puddle that just spoke so uh, resonantly to people. I mean, it was just an amazing picture. I love the image, but I was just convinced that he got it set up. Now that, now that I'm a little bit older and I know much more about Henri Cartier-Bresson, I know what his background is. I know how he worked. There are two things at play here. And I think one is that Henri was looking through this fence and saw some sort of composition, started to line it up. When that happened, the guy came through the image and jumped over the puddle. What that is, is that is preparation meeting an opportunity that comes along. And of course, Henri called his book The Decisive Moment. That's what he was about, is when is that exact moment where you're able to capture that emotion, that gesture, uh, that action, whatever it is that's coming out, what is the exact moment when you click the shutter to get that? So I wanna give you a good takeaway on this. And I wanna summarize by saying this. So when you do an analysis of a photograph, well, it's just that. It's an analysis of something that has already happened, but you're looking at 
how it works, how it works together. And you're doing that to learn. And I am a huge proponent of this. I think that everyone needs to be studying. You need to be looking at famous photographs. You need to be looking at people who inspire you. And you need to learn from that work. Be inspired by it. But at some point, I mean, it's only going to be just that. You're just analyzing their work. Now, what does happen in reality when we start shooting is this. And I think this harkens back to what I believe Henri was going for when he met that moment of opportunity, is that as photographers, and I know you've done this too, is that when you get into this practice of making photographs, you start to get the photographer eye. In other words, you'll see something in passing during the day sometime, it happened to me two days ago, where you see something that you know, man, that would have made a brilliant photograph, right? Uh, the, the way a bird flies through two buildings or, you know, whatever that is. You see it and you realize, wow, that would have made a very effective photograph. But we didn't have the camera with us, whatever. And I can tell you from my years of experience that every time I've missed the shot or I've talked about the one that got away, it was never because my brain wasn't thinking. It was always because I either didn't have my camera, I couldn't get set up fast enough, all I had was my phone and I had a text or something I was dealing with. So there's all these reasons why, but it's very important to understand. I think this is the takeaway from that that HCB image is that, you know, we get into this, this thing where, where opportunity is going to come along, but only when you're prepared to meet it. And I think that's the big takeaway here. That's when you're going to get a great image. I've talked to Ralph about this a ton and it's like, you know, not every image that you take is just going to be the banger, right? You're going to take a lot of stuff that is probably okay. You're going to take some stuff that's just really not that good. So you've got to fill the time between the really good shots that you take. And so that's what we're all striving to do. But for me anyway, that's what it comes down to is understanding one, how those abstracts fit together. What is the communication? What is the relationships between those? And then also being able to, to be ready when that opportunity comes. So I hope you guys have found this interesting. Let me know in the comments. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, later.